Welcome back to Dog Talks. Chris with P2TK9 here. This is our first Dog Talk of 2024. Took some time off for the holidays. Uh, following that, we had a pretty nasty bit of weather for a week. Um, if you're on Instagram, I'd appreciate it if you'd check out our account, P2TK9. You would see a couple of different reels and a little bit of what was going on weather-wise. Out in the snow, playing with the dogs and the kid. Following that, we've had a week of just nonstop nearly rain. So here I am hiding in the basement uh, doing another dog talk, first one for 2024. A lot of exciting things coming up for 2024, including in a week going to the 28th annual uh, canine seminar down in Dothan, Alabama. A lot of guys going to be there, haven't seen in a long time. Uh, should be a, a heck of an event. And I will have uh, some pictures and videos of that on the Instagram as well. So as you know, I am uh, also have a, a business and make canine equipment, P2TK9.com. If you would go over there for leashes, collars, and other equipment that I make and give that a, a look for me. And I would sure appreciate it. So as usual... My subject for a dog talk is generated by the day job and things that go on and happen during the day job usually gives me a lot of inspiration for what I want to do a dog talk about. There's certainly no end to the subject matter that I could do uh, dog talks on, but normally I start mulling over current events, things that have happened during the week, and that usually spurs the subject matter for the dog talk. So in this one, this installment I was going to say this week, but I haven't been exactly regimented about doing one every single week. So this installment is going to be canine detection. What kind of detection are we talking about? Is it bomb detection, narcotics detection, patrol detection? Doesn't matter. There is some granular specific subject matter that I want to address that is specific to how you go about using your dog in a detection scenario. It doesn't matter if you're doing narcotics or uh, bombs or patrol, you're still using your dog to go out and find something that you can't see that you don't know exactly where it's at. So I want to talk about the principal subject matter in doing that, some best practices, some things to stay away from. Uh, at ATK9, two years ago, I sat in on Cameron Ford's presentation, and he and I really don't have a, a dime's worth of difference between our core beliefs and what we do as far as detection. Uh, really, our only difference is going to be between single odor imprintation and cocktailing, and that can be a standalone video to itself if you guys want to Jump in there in the comments and let me know if that's something you want addressed. I'm happy to do that. But other than that, he and I really don't have any fundamental differences in what you're doing with detection. One thing that I did take away from his talk, which I think is important and noteworthy, he made a delineation between scent and odor. So I think that that's important and it is relevant as far as when you talk about courtroom testimony and explaining different disciplines of dogs. So his statement was scent should be limited to the subjects where we're talking about organic or living or once living matter. And then odor being things that come from chemical man-made substances. So if we were discussing for instance, a human, human remains dog, that is a, a dog detecting scent. Uh, fruits and nuts for CBP. Uh, if you've ever flown back in from overseas and you've landed in Chicago, you've probably seen the fruit and nut beagle working the terminal in there. Uh, very interesting. So we're talking about tracking, that is scent detection, uh, search and rescue scent detection. But then if we're talking about bomb odor, then we're going to, bomb odor, odor for bombs, then we're going to be talking about man-made substances RDX, BETN, things of that nature. So that was a, a facet to his presentation that I thought was interesting and, and worth including. But even though 
there is a difference between scent and odor and finding a live person for patrol reasons, there is really no difference how you should be going about that and what your mindset is with your dog going into it. So my number one gripe is going to be and has been for a long time uh, just handlers who get lazy and want to do all off-leash detection. There is absolutely no good reason for it and we're going to discuss how doing all off-leash detection is not only impractical, it can create a lot of training scars for you and your dog and in a lot of venues both for actual real world working results and for certification standards it's simply not possible and is is not allowed and a lot of these people who buy into it they get oftentimes training from people who say oh well the the dog needs to do self-discovery the dog needs to learn independent behavior it is infrequent i have found in the training world where people who hang their hat on the dog learning through self-discovery really a understand it b have their training matrix set up appropriately where that the dog is funneled into doing self-discovery but there are so other few options available let me put it this way the trainer is so aware of their training matrix for self-discovery that they have set something up where it limits the dog's ability to do or engage in anything else and even though the dog thinks that they are doing self-discovery they're finding their way through a maze that really had no other options and not enough trainers are available uh, or switched on enough to be able to set their training up to be that targeted and that specific so what happens normally is you end up doing a lot of off-leash work you've got the dog in an environment doing detection and again i'm not going to say scent or odor detection because for the discussion here it's both of those we're just going to call it detection because it can be either so the dog is out there roaming around supposing uh supposed to be doing some kind of, of detection or learning from it when in reality they're just roaming about the environment and maybe some of these dogs will stumble into the solution and get the training outcome that you want and another 50 or 40 percent of them won't and they're going to learn the wrong thing from the training so with that being said what has been happening uh, lately in my world that has caused me to bring this up so first of all when you're talking to guys who haven't done anything real world they automatically think that off-leash is the best way to do it why would they think off-leash is the best way to do it well in a lot of our basic training scenarios we're in a building that doesn't have much going on otherwise there aren't any security threats there are limited and usually known physical hazards to the dog and when we're there we can limit mitigate watch for and control most of those aforementioned items when you're talking about real world we may not know entirely if the building is secure we may be dealing with personnel whether it's detainees overseas in a combat scenario or if we're talking about domestic law enforcement if it's people being questioned in another room or someone being detained in handcuffs if it's a suspect what if we're there on a consensual encounter and there are people who are in control of the property present that the dog can access and if these people act shady if you've got a multi-purpose or dual purpose dog that also does apprehension we have to take these people's safety into account and so it's normally not feasible to just go and unsnap your dog and fall back on the off-leash detection piece so i've been dealing with guys who haven't done enough real world or in some cases anything real world at all and they think oh well this is how i'm going to do it i'm just going to unsnap the dog well that's wrong secondly when they unsnap the dog the first thing they want to do so for instance if we're talking about a building with a series of rooms and we're going room to room okay clear this room clear this room 
they want to stand in the hallway, unsnap the dog, and then just let it run in there. And then they stand in the threshold of the doorway and watch this dog run around and around and around. I know what you're saying. We could be talking about doorway issues or tactical discipline or fatal funnel, but none of that applies to this. So just go ahead and lay that aside, which those things are relevant in certain settings, and I'm not disputing that, but I want to talk about doing canine detection in the right way and the wrong way of utilizing off-leash detection. So you have a high drive dog. You go to the doorway of this room, you unclip it, you let the dog run into the room, and they are completely uh, sua sponte of their own accord doing whatever they want to in the room. The handler stands in the doorway or leans with one shoulder on the door jam and just stands there like some kind of a, a bump on a log and does absolutely nothing and gives the dog no actual input. And the dog just makes racetracks around this room sniffing and sniffing. So here's what happens. The dog goes into the room. They're a good quality high drive dog. They start checking some known items. Maybe they go into the room and just do a couple of quick racetracks. They don't really get to work right away, but the handler doesn't change anything that they're doing. Maybe the dog is really switched on and does go in there and start hunting right away. What normally happens is after one or two racetracks around the room with the handler standing there being deadpan doing nothing, normally what we start signaling to the dog at this point is, well, I've gone in here and I've searched this room two laps, three laps, maybe four laps, and the handler has given me absolutely no feedback. Maybe the handler knows something that I don't, and there's something in here for me to find. So with me being the good dog and looking for cues that I can draw on to get through my day, I need to start trying to find something or show interest in something to telegraph behavior that maybe there is something interesting in here and see. So let me let me break off and sidebar for a second here when we are doing canine detection what is the first thing that we are looking for that response from the dog not the trained response the first thing we're looking for is what i know a lot of you know this the change of behavior if you're law enforcement and you're going to court you're not testifying to the final response you're testifying to the change of behavior the change of behavior is a dog's physiological reaction to a known imprinted odor in its presence that that is infallible this is this is a classical conditioning type of response where the dog hits that familiar odor and it starts to do things that it cannot help it's not premeditated there's there's no input to it the final response however the sit the down whatever if if you are still handling dogs from the 1980s and you've got an aggressive alert dog all of these things that you put into them as the final response, this is a trained behavior put into them by a person and that trained behavior is fallible. So when we're in a courtroom setting and we are testifying that our dog has given us a reason to continue with detainment or initiate a warrantless search, we are in fact testifying to the change of behavior to a known imprinted odor to the dog. So with that being said, Sometimes dogs will start to try to exhibit some kind of a behavior that mimics a trained response, which we would normally refer to as a false. And they may start looking back at the handler, becoming handler dependent. Now they see if the handler changes posture. Did the handler shift? Did they go from leaning on the door jam of the room to standing upright? Are they reaching for a toy? Are they adjusting their clothes? Are they doing anything that looks like they're going for a reward object? These are the things that a dog will eventually, even if you have a great, great dog that is just rock solid, a 99.9% .9 of the time dog in, in training in real world environments, doesn't false on, I mean, maybe once every time Haley's Comet comes around, this dog has a false or an unproductive final response. But if you stand there long enough and you hold this dog in the room off leash and you give them no direction in their activities whatsoever, eventually they're going to do something bad because they want to please. They've been trained to engage with us and do certain things. 
and they're going to try to find some kind of an outcome to either go to the next room or get a reward out of you, but nothing good comes of this. So in this model, the dogs in the room, they go around, they go around, they go around. This happens very frequently and has happened to me recently with the day job. These guys stand there, bump on a log, the dog makes three trips, four trips around a room, and they haven't left the ground yet. Okay, that's fine. By the fourth trip, the dog is a good high drive dog just trying to do something. So on maybe the third to fifth lap, the dog hits a corner and decides, well, I haven't gone high or up a wall or up into a corner. I'm getting bored. I'm high drive. I know what I'm in here to do. Let me try to change it up and, and see if I can find something and make something happen because the handler's giving me no input. We're not leaving the room. There must be something in here he wants me to find. So on this third to fifth trip, the dog goes to the corner and goes up the wall, up the corner towards the ceiling only for a second or two and then leaves and continues around the room. But then he might go up and, and look up at the ceiling again. What happens to our handler? Instantly, they read that as that was a change of behavior. Oh, he's working odor high in that corner. It makes me absolutely want to have an aneurysm. No, the dog has done three to five laps in here and there's nothing in here. And I, the trainer, know there's nothing in here. But yet this person has stood here and let their dog off leash with no input run around the room until they're so bored, they're going to try to switch something up. And then immediately the handler is going to incorrectly read this as some kind of a change of behavior. Jersey Shore is driving me nuts. Uh, babe, can you call Jersey Shore in there? He wants to play, and that's not with me right now. Thank you. Love you. So, with Jersey Shore gone, you can just shut that door. would be great. Perfect. <laughs> well, that little administrative item out of the way, back to it. So we're in the room. The dog is trying anything possible. They switch up what they were doing the first three to five trips. And now we're into an OODA loop with the handler. For those of you I've spoken on this before in other videos, uh, go back and watch some of the, the library that we already have posted. Observe, Orient, Decide, Act, OODA, O-O-D-A, for those of you not familiar. But it, it is a useful acronym. It's something to think about. So once the dog goes and does something different, the handler immediately misreads this as a change of behavior and says, oh my gosh, I'm into an OODA loop of I'm going to observe and orient. And now I am sure that this dog has reacted that way to the presence of scent or odor. And now I'm, oh, now I'm really interested and sometimes uh, more inexperienced or weaker handlers will immediately go into doing something to try to help the dog. So they haven't been any help at all up to this point, nothing about pattern or specific spots in the room. If you're going to work off leash, off leash doesn't mean you become a sack of shit. Off leash means that you want both hands free for some reason or another. Perhaps there are a lot of entanglement hazards present. Perhaps you need both hands free to handle a weapon, a light, other types of items, but you need both hands and you don't want the entanglement hazard of a leash of any length, not six, not 12, not 15, not 30. I need this dog loose. There are no possible bad bites that are going to take place as, as a result of this. The dog can't exit the building or do something hazardous. So we're going to go off leash. Off leash means my hands are free, but I am still doing all of the things you should do with your dog. Present productive areas, knock this thing out and move on to the next. So with that being said, up to this point, our handler who is doing their version of off leash has given the dog absolutely no input. Now the dog on the third to fifth trip does something, now all of a sudden the handler is in this OODA loop and now they start to engage in some way. What you got, buddy? Shook up, go high, look over there. And so now the handler has given the dog feedback 
And now we're going back and forth. Oh, so the dog reacts to the handler and the dog gives a little bit more interest. So the handler's interest comes up and then prompts the dog more. And now we are just circling the toilet. This thing is getting ready to go straight down because the more the handler encourages the dog to engage in the behavior, the more the dog feels that they are being prompted by the handler to, to follow this lead that the handler's telling them you're on the right path. So they show more behavior, which further solidifies in the handler's mind that the dog is, is doing the right thing and that they're on odor. And you can see where this thing goes. A handler can talk a solid dog right into a false or some kind of a bad behavior doing this. It is horrible. It's the absolute one, I, I can't say the bane of my existence because I've got at least a top 10 list of pet peeves that are horrible in the dog world that need to go away. But man, this one's got to be top three. This is, this is horrible. So you are engaging in a behavior that is eventually going to end in an unproductive alert, a false, whatever terminology your, your department or agency wants to use, but nothing good comes of this. And if you are working double blinds or you've been sent in, on a real heavy real world validation, which might mean I have preloaded a building or laid an outdoor route and tell you where to start and where to stop. And I'm not going in there with you and you're going to work all unknown blind hide solo. And then you're going to come out to me uh, with a list that says uh, these were uh, the areas of my changes of behaviors and or alerts. These were the rooms. These are my numbers. Uh, if you're in there on your own and you start hucking that toy and you have talked these dogs into bad finals, you're going to create problems with your dog. So I have one mantra when it comes to canine detection. Does not matter if it's a car. Doesn't matter if it's, it's in a building. Doesn't matter if it's outside on an open area or a, a lane of some kind, what we would refer to in this business as an IED lane or a route clear, here is the one thing in canine detection that you need to live by. Ready? Find it or rule it out as a possibility. Period in. You see your dog do something, you need to find it, step in there, the area wherever you thought the dog showed a change of behavior or interest, immediately step in there and either find it or rule this out as a possibility in your mind and be done with it and don't come back. That is the best advice that I can give you. It will solve the majority of your problems and this is what that looks like. So whether you are on leash or off leash, because again, I just explained that when you are off leash, that doesn't mean that you are off duty or out of the equation. You still need to engage with your dog and work a good sensible pattern and get in there and do things the right way the first time. Does that mean, oh, I stand back and let my dog do a first initial one or two laps around the room because I want them to free hunt and see if they show me anything? No. A good number of dogs over time, if you commit to that, they will go into a room and they are going to learn one thing at least 50% of the time. Uh, some dogs are going to be really committed and just switched on winners and high drive. And they may not learn this as a training scar, but at least half of them, maybe more will. Oh, dad wants me to work or mom. Sorry, I want to be inclusive. The handler wants me to work. So I come up to the doorway, handler cuts me loose. I get one or two laps of screw off time and I get to go in here and sniff the things I want to sniff or sniff nothing at all. But I get to go run willy nilly around this room and pull one or two hot laps. Then the handler on or off leash is going to step in and then they're going to drill down and make me go to work. So that's the first training scar that can occur is a dog that just learns the first part of this is just complete screw off time and I don't have to do anything until the handler steps in and makes me do anything and then that's when I get serious. Again, that's at least for half, maybe more than half of dogs. They will learn that and that will be a training scar and as soon as you cut them off leaves, 
off leash. It's willy nilly time, not get down to business time. Then once you step in, whether you're on off leash or you put the leash back on them, now they know, oh, it's serious and I have to actually do my job. So that's the first thing that's wrong with all of this. The second thing that can go wrong is if there is a training aid in the room and you cut your dog off leash and the dog does happen to go in off leash and find this on their own, some people will say, man, look how independent my dog is. That's great. It's self-discovery. There is some truth to that. I'm going to go back on another principle that I have discussed in other videos that's also applicable here. There is no training methodology. There is no exercise. There's nothing you can do in the training world ad infinitum, ad nausea, where you just hit it over and over and over and you don't have some unforeseen, unintended consequence. The second and third order effects. If you rely heavily on being off leash and your dog gets really, really good off leash, and the dog starts to find a lot of these training aids, if it's a training environment, a training aid, or they're making real world finds on their own without you, it's good to a degree. But when this goes on long enough, your role as a handler diminishes. The minute that you cannot do it off leash and you have to have the dog on leash, side of a highway, uh, if you're law enforcement and you have to go to an occupied school where students are moving about, if you have to go to an office building where people are present, this can be narcotics or bomb detection. If there are people around you, if this is not a secure, empty building and you have to be on leash, but your dog has historically in training and in some real world usage scenarios, this dog has been working off leash and finding stuff on its own. The minute you need to step in there and make this dog work, they are going to absolutely ignore you because they have learned in this stimulus response reward model. I go out, I look for the scent or the odor. I have the change of behavior. I recognize it. I final the response and then the reward is given. That equation doesn't involve the handler anymore. The handler never helps me find anything going out, locating this and getting my reward is all on me. So the minute that you have real world constraints where you cannot be off leash with this dog and you have to step in and get it done on leash, the dog is going to ignore you completely or have very poor, very uncoordinated handling. Um, it's very obvious if you do a certification or even a, a real world engagement. If you're out with a handler who has been doing a lot of off leash stuff, they don't have the muscle memory. They're not good handling a leash and the dog shows that they don't uh, work, get worked on leash very much because the dog is ignoring them. They look discombobulated. When, when you watch a, a good dog team work and, and the handler is good with a leash and comfortable with it, to me, I, I, I love this job. I love this, this working discipline. And I can almost hear music in my head. It is a ballroom dance when you see a good dog team working any environment, indoor or outdoor or around a car, and nobody's getting tangled on the leash. It's not going under the dog's legs. The dog isn't frustrated. The handler isn't frustrated and they're just moving around the environment, hitting productive areas and, and moving together, it is an absolute symphony. When you look at a team that hasn't done that and all of a sudden for certification or real world usage, they're on a leash and they don't practice it and they're not good at it, you hear that scratchy needle coming off the record, you, you hear the horrible thrash metal music and things crashing it's it's absolutely painful to watch and it hurts my heart deep down because that's not the way that it should be so with that being said there's the next training scar that can come up from this is a dog that's unresponsive on leash uh, i knew a guy at one point who was a dog handler for security at a major casino hotel in las vegas it's a hotel room, not a lot of square footage, fairly dense as far as furniture, one or two beds, nightstands, a couch, TV, 
couple of, of drawers for your clothing in there. So it's, it's kind of a, a cramped footprint. So this guy during training and real world usage would stand at the door and let his dog go. And this dog would absolutely just, he, he was in the top 10% of dogs. He learned it. He understood it. He was very solid, very high drive, learned the patterns. At least when they were doing their, their training scenarios, the aids were being placed in a way that were very positive for the dog. They learned the pattern. They learned how to check obscure areas. The, the dog had this whole system down uh, and they were successful. They had a lot of, of real world finds in this setting. However, in a few scenarios, both in training and real world usage, when this uh, handler had to put the dog on leash and make him search with the dog on the leash, the dog completely ignored him would go out of his way to not look at him, would go behind him. I mean, it, it was absolutely that scenario where you hear the needle coming off the record. It, it was terrible. And that was a manifestation of this training scar where the dog says, no, no, I do this all on my own. I'm successful on my own. You just stand there and be the toy dispenser. I'll show you when I've got something. So those are the things that can manifest in that situation. So I don't want to explain all the things that are wrong with this without giving you the action items and the things that you can do in order to not be this person. So when you are doing a search, if you are indoors, you're going to start from outside the room. I always want to see what is happening with either the climate controls or the natural drafts of this building, what's going on with it. If I've got a room to step into, I'm going to start from out in the hallway or out in the adjoining room that goes through the next doorway because I want, if there are any cones, scent or odor cones leaving that room from either threshold, I don't want to walk through that uh, let me give you a quick mental image on this. So as this scent or odor begins to calm down and move through the environment, think about even though odor doesn't really rise unless there's a heat source, you can think of cigarette smoke or dry ice vapor. Once the environment has settled, it's going to start moving naturally with the drafts and with the air currents that are present in the environment and it's going to settle down and start doing its own thing. Now, if you take your hand with that cigarette smoke or that dry ice vapor and you wave your hand through it, you can see it break up and move around and disperse a little bit within the environment. So mentally, I want you to have the picture that if people haven't been in this room in the last few minutes and you've been asked to go in here and do canine based detection in this room, I would prefer to have everybody out of the room, the room to have settled down for a few minutes and try to let that vapor trail do its own thing that is in coordination with the environment as it's, it's sitting right now. And hopefully that vapor trail, that dry ice vapor or that cigarette smoke trail is going to be leaving the room and it's going to settle down and there will be something there for the dog to find. If I just go plunging through the doorway with the dog with me, then as we walk through that, our legs, our body, our movements are the same thing we talked about with the dry ice or the cigarette smoke. We just broke all of that up and dissipated it. So rather than this nice thin stream or ribbon that the dog can locate and follow to source or start zoning in on where source is at, we just broke all of that up and scattered it around and now you're talking about what, what I have termed the snow globe effect. So when you've got the snow globe and everything settles at the bottom, it's all nice and calm in there. But then when you shake it and you agitate the snow globe, then everything is spinning and swirling about. So we've gone from a nice environment where it's kind of settled down and is working naturally within the parameters. We walk through that, we go in there and we bust it up. And now this thing is swirling all around. The dog may go in there and throw its head up and start sniffing all about and the dog is probably not wrong but now because we've really busted that up it's all around and it's not 
useful. It's, it's not as useful as it was two minutes ago before we broke it up for the dog to have a nice efficient search and give us the best information possible in the shortest, most efficient amount of time. So again, going back to the start, the room is settled. We let the, the scent or the odor settle and start doing its thing. I start from outside the room and I just cast the dog off leash or on, it doesn't matter. I'm going to start the dog uh, normally in a down, get that dog to lay down to be at the bottom. Uh, if odor or scent is high, it's going to be coming down to me unless it has a heat source, such as being a live person or being heated in some other way, uh, climate controls in the room. Normally it's gonna be coming down and out of the room to me in some way. So I'm going to start my dog at a down and I want to be two, three, four feet out of this room and get that dog's nose down close to the floor. And I want to send them in at a diagonal to the door jam. If I can send that dog at an angle, if the environment permits where they can cross both door jams in kind of a straight line, if a trail is coming out of that room from either side, if they cross it, Hopefully the idea is they're going to hit it at one side or the other. <clears throat> Either they're going to button hook the near side of the door or they're going to take the far side of the door because that's where they're getting this odor or scent coming from and they're going to follow the opposite side of the room. And I'm, I'm going to at least on first in, entry allow that to be shooter's choice for the dog which side they want to go to. Once we step in there, if this dog is mouth closed, nose sampling, working along a wall, whether it's button hook or opposite wall, I'm going to entertain that for at least a few seconds and see what they're doing. If this dog pulls me either wall and they go halfway down that wall and then they quit pulling on the leash and they come up slack a little or they, they move out to the middle of the room and they quit nasal sampling, Yes, a dog can absolutely do detection panting and with their mouth open, but if I have a mouth closed, very, very focused effort, I'm going to follow that effort until that effort changes. Now I'm going to say, all right, he's not actively following anything. Now I'm going to reset and do an efficient knockdown of this room. So I'm gonna go back to the doorway most dog handlers are going to work from left to right. Dog is on the left side, leash is in the left hand. Your right hand is going to be your presentation hand and we're going to start working around this room. Uh, my first dog experience, my first police canine, my basic course and my training were at Von Lick Kennel and Ken Licklider is absolutely not wrong about handling a leash with both hands uh, Ken, as most of you know who are familiar with him, came from the Lackland system. And even from the time he was a handler, standing in front of a high drive dog, kneeing them in the head, body blocking, walking backwards, he realized that that was wrong. And he was absolutely correct about that being wrong. And that was my first exposure to the canine world 24, 25 years ago now was handle a leash with both hands, let the dog pass you. You are out away from your targeted search, whether it's the wall and furniture in a room or whether it's around the exterior of a car. I'm allowing this dog the freedom and ability to pass along my search targets between me. I'm not blocking or being a physical impediment to the dog. If they wanna pass, I let them pass, but I don't have to go with them. I switch hands with the leash and stop. Then I'm directing with the left hand on a redirect and I'm going to go methodically around this search. Again, right now we're talking about in a room. Doesn't matter if we're talking about outside on a vehicle, but we'll address that separately here in a second. So I'm in the room, we make entry, dog gives me six or eight feet into the room on a focused, uh, what appears to be a, a focused search. The dog changes in any meaningful way whatsoever. All right, reset. We're going to do this room one time, no more than twice, and we are moving on to the next because what is the mantra? Either find it or rule it out as a possibility. 
and move on. So I go back to the door jam. I go low at the door jam again from the interior of the room and I begin to work everything in an orderly fashion as we go around the room, hitting productive areas, making sure with my training and experience and my history of, uh, for the shooter's world, we'll, we'll call it dope, data on previous engagements. So all of your data on previous engagements, whether they have been in a training environment or a real world use scenario, I've got a catalog of all of this in my head and I'm going to look at this room. What's the construction of the room? Where are gaps and seams in the wall? Absolutely, there could be something hidden in the wall, but sheetrock does not vent scent or odor, but gaps in the sheetrock and breaches in the sheetrock will. So where the sheetrock meets the baseboard at the bottom of the floor, where a sheetrock has had a cutout put into it for an outlet box or a light switch. These are areas where a wall hide can have that odor off gas and vent and where you can find that odor from. If it's a drop ceiling, it can be coming through ceiling tiles. So I may have the dog go up the wall in a couple of key areas. Normally I limit that to the four corners of the room or how many ever corners it has, unless there's something compelling along the way that I need to do. Um, if there's an exterior pipe chase where I've got something that's boxed out that goes up the wall to the ceiling. And again, that's another avenue for scent or odor in the ceiling to be traveling down that pipe chase. I'm hitting the furniture. If it's a concrete floor, unless I have some kind of reason to believe that even though we're on a concrete foundation with carpet over it, that there is a breach in the floor or that there's some irregularity in the carpet that may indicate a door underneath the carpet, you're probably not going to have anything escaping through a concrete pad, but I'm not going to really hit the floor if I'm in a building that has slat wood floor construction or something else that can have a false bottom or room under it where there could be a floor hide that I'm putting the dog checking down on the floor. Uh, we're going to check the TVs, the electronics, make sure that, that there hasn't been some kind of hidden compartment or a hide made out of any of these large uh, electronic consumer devices. We're going to go all the way around the room and we're going to hit it in order in areas where that dog shows a focused effort and breaks ahead of me, I will entertain that to a degree until it looks like the dog is just pulling out of drive or excitement or until that moment where the dog physically shows me a change where it's no longer that hard focused effort that I allowed them to deviate from, from what we were doing at that moment to pursue. Then we're going to fall back, pick up exactly where we left off, and we're going to knock this thing out. A room of average size, let's, let's talk about, we'll keep it simple. Let's talk about a, a room in a house, even a master bedroom in a house, a, a nice suite that's 20 by 20, a, a pretty darn nice bedroom. I have seen handlers, I have done certifications, I have done training, again, I'm going to revert back to the day job and sometimes you're dealing with guys with no real world experience and you present them with a series of rooms and 20 by 20 on some of these rooms is generous and some of these rooms have a minimum amount of furniture and I'm standing there looking at my watch ready to absolutely crawl out of my own skin. I want to scream. I'm watching the time tick by as handlers have their dogs in these rooms. And sometimes it's off leash, sometimes it's, it's on. 45 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, two minutes, two minutes plus. I'm looking at them, telling them there's no reason you should be in this room for two minutes. There is not two minutes of canine work to do in this room. You need to come in here this room on its best day, if I'm letting you take your time, should be 30 seconds in this room in and out. The more time you spend in there, the more self-doubt that you have, the more redirects that you do, the more you're going to try to convince this dog 
there's something in here that I want you to find. So I'm going back. I'm going to just hammer it, hammer it, hammer it. Find what you're looking for or rule it out as a possibility and don't come back. Don't, don't have second doubts unless you have a reason where there is a hand search team following behind you and they come to you on this objective in, in this search and say, hey, while we were hand tossing this thing behind you, we found signs of a patch in the wall or something in the floor. Could you come back and check one more time? Unless you get some seriously new compelling information to go back, do not go back. Trust your dog. If you have a good dog, if your dog has a proven track record and you are working blind hides in training, which you absolutely should all the time, there is no reason for you to have this self-doubt and go back to these rooms later. Maybe you missed it. Maybe it wasn't here. Don't go back and just keep building self-doubt into yourself and training scars into your dog. So find it or rule it out as a possibility. I hit the room. I do everything in order. Even given a 20 by 20 room, 400 square feet of space, this is not a lengthy search. This, unless you're talking, and, and, and let's stick within the example given your your average bedroom or an office setting where it's not just absolutely piled cram full of stuff i'm not talking about a mini storage space or some crazy cat lady some hoarder who only has an ant trail through their house and everything else is just piled full of of crap and and hoarded items in their house or their dwelling that's that's a Totally different ball game, and that can be a whole lot more challenging and requires more time in there with your dog. But given a normal setting, the average person's house and furnishings and things that they need in their environment, this is not a two or three minute ordeal in a 20 by 20 room. Go in there. I call it a, a knockdown of a room. Go in there and knock this thing down in a logical order finding the productive areas. Don't wait to make one whole lap around this room and then go back and have your dog go high all the way around the room. Even that can place doubt in your dog and start creating performance deficiencies. If you're going to go high in this room, do what I just said. Hit all four corners and any place between the corners along the way that has some compelling reason that you should go high in that room and get it on the first pass. Do everything, if at all possible, on the first pass and be done with it. Your job as the handler is to be quality assistance, quality control, quality assistance, quality assurance, quality control as you go around this room. If you held your dog to a performance standard and you checked everything, then absolutely you should have confidence that you can leave. When will I go back into a room? If I went into a room and I did an effective knockdown and I am exiting the room and I hit that hallway and I hear that dog's bottom jaw slap shut and they go <laughs> and do a nasal sampling and they turn and curl back under themselves or do a hard U-turn and go back into that room, that is the only exception that I will give to going back into a room. I'm not perfect. My dog's not perfect. But if we hit that hallway and that dog finds a scent or odor cone and does an immediate change of behavior, jaw slap shut, nasal snort, nasal sampling, and goes back into that room on a focused pull, I'm going to entertain that. I'm going to follow them as best as I can back into the room and give them enough leeway to try to yard dart and hit that spot that they, they found that scent or odor leaving the room emanating from. I'm going to do one more limited knockdown. I don't want to do the whole room again unless I have to. If I do that room a second time, I'm not going back. There, there's just no way. Um, dogs can throw a change of behavior. They can display all of uh, the physical traits that I just described for anomalous odors. 
Maybe it was one they didn't sample the first time on the way through. It could be animal odor, food odor, perfume. The more real world engagements you have, the more odd things you'll see and the more canine behavior you will observe. I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, sophomoric or provocative, but it can be used feminine hygiene products in a trash can. It can, it can be all kinds of things. Um, it is mind boggling the stuff you find in, in people's houses and hotel rooms. Um, leftover items after sexual activity will absolutely get a dog's attention and make them go and investigate it. But there could be something anomalous in that room that, that took that dog back in there. But if I go in a second time and I do a, a second knockdown of that room and I don't have a productive change of behavior leading to the discovery of something that we're in there to find, I am not going back, uh, period in. So when guys start feeling the pressure and they rehunt a room and they rehunt a room and they rehunt a room, Nothing good comes of that. Your, your confidence as a handler is shattered. You start creating these training scars with your dog, and it's this circling the toilet, going down the drain, OODA loop all over again. So we do a knockdown. We're on to the next. I'm hunting back into the hallway or the adjoining room, starting outside the doorway of the next hall, and we are going to find it or rule it out as a possibility. If I'm halfway around a room, and a dog gives me that focused searching behavior and takes me backtracking, I'm going to entertain that. I will go back to a wall, a door, a baseboard, a piece of furniture that I just searched, but now we're on the opposite side of it and the dog backtracks. I am going to, again, fall back on, find it or rule it out as a possibility. If we go back and we hit this piece of furniture or this area again, and I do a good job with it, we're going to be systematic. Here's the next, here's the next, here's the next. Check this, check this, check this. And if the dog gives me nothing else on that second pass, I am ruling that out as a possibility in my mind. We are moving on to the next item. On a vehicle, when you're outdoors, the same rule applies. There are some different factors involved with consideration, namely your wind direction. If the, the situation allows, if safety allows, if tactics allow, always be on the downwind flank. There's never a time where you don't want the wind coming to you and your dog, if at all possible. Uh, there, there's just no reason not to do that unless you have serious mitigating factors with safety that prevent you from moving to the downwind flank. If it's a car, Again, the old methodology was one and a half times around the car, start at the driver's headlight. There's no reason where you have to start on a car if safety allows, go to the downwind side of that car and have you a good knockdown strategy. I'm going to break the plane underneath the front and rear bumper. So let's, let's do it in order. Um, I've got the downwind is the rear bumper of this car. I'm going to start at the rear of this car. I'm going to have the dog break the plane and breaking the plane is important. That means putting their nose and head, getting them to go past just the threshold of the bumper or the plastic ground effects of this car, but give me a sniff of the undercarriage. I'm going to check the trunk seam. I'm going to continue around. I'm going to break the plane at the wheel wells check the door seams. Doesn't matter if it's a one, uh, two or four door car. If it has one or two door seams on each side, I'm going to hit the door seams. I'm going to break the plane on the car mid frame, halfway between at least the front and rear wheel of whatever vehicle I'm searching. I'm going to break the plane around the halfway mark on the frame of that vehicle along the way. Going to hit that front wheel well, going to come around the front of the vehicle. I'm going to hit that grill and the hood area, break the plane at the front bumper. And then we are going to absolutely just rinse and repeat the other side, break the plane of the wheel well, door seams underneath the uh, mid, mid frame of the vehicle, 
rear wheel well, break the plane, and then end this thing. Why do I keep hammering on breaking the plane? And it doesn't matter if you are in a building or if you are outdoors doing a car, if it's furniture, if it's a, uh, a low desk or a bookshelf or a TV stand that has space at the bottom or underneath it, break the plane. Even if it's a dining room table with chairs around it, that looks like that's pretty open and air is moving easily. Break the plane, break the plane. Think of any time you have ever looked at video from a wind tunnel or airplane testing. Even look at when you've been wading in a creek or a river and look at the hydrodynamics of the way the water flows around rocks and stumps in rivers and streams there are going to be eddies and if you okay quick quick sidebar what makes an airplane wing or a bird wing have lift what puts them in the air what makes them get off the ground when a airplane wing or a bird's wing moves through the air it splits the air and you get low pressure air on the top of the wing and you get high pressure air building under the wing and this differential of high pressure and low pressure creates lift. Through my observations, again, over the last 24, 25 now years, even indoors and especially outdoors where there are more wind currents available, you can see this airplane wing type effect and there will be a high pressure and a low pressure effect. And that high and low pressure, if you have a vehicle, for example, and you think that this could be something holding substance under there that you're interested, uh, driveline, engine frame, or engine frame, uh, vehicle frame, engine compartment, if it's under this vehicle and air is moving around it, that can create this high and low pressure effect and it can hold a lot of that odor under there just by virtue of the air moving around the vehicle. The newer the vehicle, the greater the effect. These vehicles spend time in a wind tunnel in order to push air around them and keep air from going underneath them. If you've watched a vehicle test in a wind tunnel, they hold the smoke stream out there and they want to see that smoke stream and air hit the vehicle and go up and over it, not under it, for the sake of fuel efficiency and speed. That's the whole study of aerodynamics. So when you're outside and you're talking about a car that has been in a wind tunnel, which has been designed specifically to shun the air around it and push it to the side and over the top and keep it from going underneath, it is going to hold scent or odor underneath that vehicle just as a physical function of engineering. So you've got to break that plane and give that dog the ability to break through that air that is being pushed around the vehicle and get under there to that lesser moving air, that pocket underneath, and see if there is scent or odor available for the purposes of detection that your dog can find. I did three years with the State Department's program, and that can be a separate video on what a debacle that whole shit show is. But their, uh, their certification process at their training and certification center in Winchester, Virginia is no joke. Uh, it is not for the faint of heart. And when they put a hide on the bottom of a vehicle at that training facility and you're there for certification, and you don't break the plane underneath that car at least at all four spots that I just described, you are going to fail certification and you are never going to get sent overseas to make any money. Uh, it period in. They do deep hides way underneath the vehicles. And if you don't get your dog's nose underneath the edge of that vehicle and break that plane, you are never going to pass their gauntlet of certification. Uh, so with that being said, there, there are real reasons to do that and it should be part of your search. Even indoors, to a lesser extent with that air moving, you're going to have high and low pressure. And I referenced the dining room table with chairs under it. You'd be surprised how well 
just having those chairs sitting there can keep that air a little bit stagnant underneath that table. And when you take your dog around that table, if you don't break that plane and kind of get under the table and between the legs of a, of a few of those chairs, how that odor will just kind of odor or scent can pool up and just hang out underneath there. So part of your knockdown, whether you're doing a room or a building, should a built or a room or a building, whether you're doing a room in a building or an entire building or a car needs to include breaking the plane. So now we're going to move on to our final category, which is the open area slash route clear slash IED lane. Same rules apply. Use the wind to the greatest advantage possible. Know how that scent or odor relates to the position of your dog and make sure that you are going to the upwind flank frequently to make sure that you are covering the landscape as, as effectively as you need to for your purposes. And remember this, handlers, especially you handlers out there who need some humility and understanding. When the wind is blowing that way, that way, any scent or odor present is going that way. The source has to be at least here or up. Okay, follow me now. If the wind is going that way and the source is on the upwind flank, your dog has to go that way to find it. If I had a dollar for every time that I've had a handler going that way, chasing their dog downwind, downstream, telling me my dog's on odor, my dog's on odor, I wouldn't be doing this video right now. I would be somewhere down probably in a very nice house in the panhandle of Florida doing a ton of fishing uh, somewhere outside of Destin. Uh, I wouldn't be working anymore. So with that being said, wind is everything and use your wind accordingly and your dog cannot chase scent or odor going downwind. If the source is on the downwind flank, your dog cannot be on the upwind flank chasing the source of that scent or odor. If you need deeper clarification on that or visual aids, put it in the comments and I'll do a standalone video. Back to the IED slash open area slash route clear. Figure out what your parameters need to be, how much further outside your targeted search area you need to go. Uh, just call that an overbuild. So if my four corners are A, B, C, D, I'm going to, based on needs and wind and overlap, I'm going to add 10, 20 feet to that, whatever I think is uh, appropriate given the situation. And then I'm going to start my outdoor knockdown of this environment. Again, same rules apply. Fall back on your data on previous engagements. Where have training aids been before? Uh, what are the bad guys in my AO right now doing? What have they been known to do? What is plausible to do? What have I found in the past in productive areas? What could be productive given what I'm up to right now? and work that environment accordingly, do a logical knockdown. When I'm outdoors, I'm going to hit things that look sketchy, some things that don't even look sketchy, but need checked anyway, don't gloss them over. If my dog does a head throw and doubles back to a particular object, I am going to do a knockdown on that object on the spot, and I'm either going to Find it or rule it out as a possibility. If it's a rock pile, if it's a culvert underneath the road, whatever this is, whatever terrain feature that my dog showed interest in, I'm going to do a logical 360, some kind of a, of a detail, give this dog directed points to hit. And if I don't get anything further, I am going to rule that out as a possibility. What if I get 15, 20 yards away from it and the dog runs back to the rock pile. If you're outdoors, we could be talking about rodents, we could be talking about food trash, we could be talking about human waste, animal marking. There's a ton of things out there that can make your dog sensitive to that. 
if my dog showed interest and I went over there and I did a good quality knockdown of this thing, got the dog low, got the dog high as that is relevant given whatever situation you're in, went all the way around it. I did a 360 so that I got this area of interest from every possible wind direction because we're talking about the outdoor environment again. If I did a 360 on that thing, I'm done with it. Um, hey, dogs aren't perfect. Even if you're talking about my line of work and we are looking at a route clear or some kind of IED lane, that's why we have multiple layers uh, to this entire operation, including metal detectors, jammers, all kinds of other neat equipment. Those things are all in play for a reason. So dogs, not a hundred percent, but they are really, really good. But as far as detecting odor goes, if I did a good knockdown, I got a 360 based on the wind out of that time to drive on and rule it out of my mind as a possibility. Um, I keep coming back to that because I want to drive it home. And that is the biggest thing you can do for your own sanity and your self-confidence is rule it out of your, out of uh, your mind as a possibility to, okay, we checked it. We double checked it. I'm done with it. I'm confident in my skills and my training and in that of my dogs. My dog has performed over and over. Um, I have proven myself in a certification environment running these blind unknown hides. I am good. I'm, I'm not flawless. I'm not perfect. You can't catch everything, but I have a track record of success both in the training and in the real world environment. I'm ruling it out and I'm moving on. Um, and, and at the end of the day, that's the best you can do as a dog handler. So wrapping it up here. Do not just stand and turn your dog off leash. Don't just be a bump on a log and let them run around. That is not what off leash is for. There's nothing good that can come out of that for you or them. If you're going to go off leash, you step in there exactly like you were going to if you were on leash and do a good, well thought out, efficient knockdown of this room or this vehicle or this outdoor terrain and get the job done. Find what there is to find in the most sensible, safest, efficient manner possible and uh, call it a day. So that's this week's topic. This week, again, sorry about that. That's this installment's topic where we're going from practical to tactical on another subject. Any comments, go ahead and leave them. I would sure appreciate it if you subscribe, share the video. Uh, do check me out on Instagram. I feel like I've got a pretty balanced uh, Instagram account with a lot of different interesting things going on over there. Um, my day job, I'm super blessed and I get to go with a pretty hearty budget and travel all over the country and do a lot of stuff and a lot of uh, wazoo training that a lot of departments just don't have the, the budget or the ability to do. Um, and I'm more than happy to share that with all of you out there. Uh, to the extent possible, um, but definitely will give you the highlights, the takeaways, and the good information from that. Train hard, do well, and we will absolutely see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.